Hello, brother. Hello there. You're welcome to my channel. My name is Festus. I promise to bring this lesson today. It's going to be hot. It's going to be very interesting. So I want you to sit, relax, and spend a little time to watch what I'm about to present. There are seven church teachings that are going viral that I took my time out to check out in the scriptures, the Bible, to find whether they are there. You'll be shocked at the discovery that these seven, what, that these seven teachings that have been embraced and accepted by many Christians as being the gospel truth, you'll be shocked to find out whether they are in the scriptures or not. So this video is going to actually treat those seven teachings of some popular pastors, popular televangelists, whether we can find those teachings in the scriptures today. So before we delve into this lesson, I want you to hit the subscribe button and the bell of notification. Click all video so that you always don't miss any of our videos. The subscription is free. You are not going to be charged for it. If this video provides you the great guidance, please like it and share it so that other Christians can see, can watch as well. Thank you. You are welcome. This is a channel that has been dedicated to Christians, pastors, where we, where, where we handle the hardcore truths. Those things we can't talk about in church, this is where we talk about them. So I, today, let's delve right into the lesson. I pray uh, we'll be able to, you know, complete this in a very short time. I have provided the uh, some of the scriptures of this lesson in the description below. So feel free to look at them. We are, go we are talking about seven church teachings, seven church teachings that are trending in the country for now. I made a research on these seven over the week to see if they would resonate with the teachings of the scriptures. So here are my findings. Let us go over those seven trending teachings uh, of uh, great televangelists and see what they really are. The first one says, I have power, and the power is mentioned to be a bit of shaker. I'm sure you are familiar with that. Ganduka, Gandusa. I'm sure you are familiar with that. Citadel and the rest of them. Every YouTuber is familiar with those words. Can we really find this? power, these seven powers or what? Can you really find these powers in scriptures in the Bible? We'll look at that soon. We'll have another one, another teaching. Anyone not paying his tithe will not go to heaven. Period. I'm sure you are familiar with that. So we're going to see whether we can find that in scriptures. We'll have number three, men should help only their fellow men. And women should help themselves. Because helping women might result 
in scandal. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. With that. With that. Number four, you will never suffer or hunger if you give your life to Jesus Christ. Number five, sow into my ministry and you will become a millionaire. God will bless you richly and make you a great millionaire if you give to my church. These are teachings that are trending. We'll find whether they have their foundation in scriptures. Number six, Paul's writings are not the words of Jesus Christ, nor of God. They are not the words of Jesus Christ. I hope you are familiar with that trending teaching. We are going to lay that idea side by side with scriptures just almost immediately. Number seven, Mariology. The idea that Mary is our advocate, is the one praying to Jesus Christ for us. You know, if you want to reach God, it's difficult if you want to reach Jesus, it's difficult. But if you reach through the woman, the mother, that's the idea behind Mariology. Mary will beg his son on your behalf. And that Mary is our mother and also the mother of God. We are to worship her. That ideology, does it resonate with the scriptures? We will find out in this video. So please stay tuned. If you have just joined us, please click the subscribe button and the bell of notification so that you don't miss our next video. Thank you. Let's go right into it, into these seven teachings that have gone viral. Seven church teachings, viral church teachings that, are, that Christians are, you know, running around with every day. The first one is I have power and the powers are Bill Shaker. Ganduka, Gandusa, Citadel, and the rest of them. Are these God's powers? Do they come from the scriptures? Do they have any form of scriptural um, foundation? When we examine the scriptures from the Old Testament to the New Testament, you will find one singular power that the saints of old used. And in the New Testament, the same power. And that power is called the Holy Spirit's anointing. The saints of kings, the Holy Spirit came on them and they did God's work. But he didn't resident in them. He left them as soon as they finished. Examples of those are, are this is, uh, we see, uh, saw that the Spirit of God came upon him briefly. I will see also um, Samson, the Spirit of God came upon him and he judged Israel and defeated the Philistines. But the Spirit was intermittent upon him. He wasn't permanently resident with him. But then, getting to the New Testament, we see that because of the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit was now given to the church, the children of God in the New Testament, as a result of grace, permanently. Say so the Spirit will dwell with you forever. If you look at the Jesus Christ speaking to the apostles, he said you will receive the Holy Spirit, he will teach you things to come, he will rebuke the word concerning sin and of righteousness, and the Spirit will take what has been taught and reveal them to you and will dwell with you forever. And if we look at Acts chapter 10, verse 38, even Jesus himself used just one power 
He didn't use Abido Sheka, Ganduka, Ganduza, Citadel, and the rest of them. He used just one power, and that power is the power of the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, who went about doing good, but but something was omitted there. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. Holy Ghost is not separate. Power is not separate. They are just the same thing. It's just a matter of semantics. Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost power. And he went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. That's what that scripture says. So, just one power of the Holy Spirit. Then Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles who were praying in the upper room and he stood upon their heads like, like, uh, uh, like fire, like tongues of fire. And that is that is just the only kind of power we have from uh, we have in the scriptures, which, which is from God. There is no other power that is called seven powers or twelve powers or Abidosheka, Ganduga, Ganduka, Gandusa, Citadel, and the rest of them. So Christians should know that any power outside of the Holy Spirit's power is strange. It's strange. That's strange fire. It's strange fire. Now we'll move on to. Number two, which says another wrong, another church teaching that we try to lay on the scriptures to find out where they resonate. Anyone not paying that is not going to heaven, period. When we try to search the New Testament, which is the scriptures that is so 100% binding on believers today because of because we are in the grace era we can't find such statement made by peter paul nor any of the apostles of old neither did jesus make make such statement even in the new uh, old testament god only pronounced a curse for not on the on, on the Old Testament believers for not fulfilling the requirement of the law, which was for tithing, it cost them because they failed to meet the requirements of the law. Today we no longer follow that law. Jesus Christ has redeemed us from all causes and has encouraged believers to give to the work of God willingly, cheerfully, abundantly. So there's no place where it said, if you do not pay your tithe, you will not make heaven. When you look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, the Bible says, we were not redeemed by silver and gold. Silver and gold simply means money. We were not redeemed with money, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. If God, if money was God's problem, he wouldn't have sent Jesus. He would have simply found a way to pay with money to redeem us. But he sent his son who had to give his blood in exchange for our salvation. So God would not uh, make money the criteria, the, 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 the condition upon which the believer will make heaven. Jesus Christ paid with his blood, and so silver and gold will not be the condition. Then when you also look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible makes it very clear that Jesus Christ has set us free through his blood. He has set us free to, through his blood and not money. So that scripture, that, uh, that statement is not from the scriptures, does not have any foundation in scriptures. Number three, men should help only their fellow men, 
Women should help themselves. Helping women can bring scandal. This statement cannot be found in the scriptures. Because in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, the Lord commanded through the Apostle Paul that we should help all people. He said, do good unto all men. Now, the men there is not, it does not mean male. Men is not used to mean male in that scripture, but people, both male and female. So as much as you have the opportunity to do good to all people, both male and female, but with emphasis on those who belong to the body of Christ. That is what that scripture says Galatians chapter, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. And even the scripture says that in Christ, there is neither male or female. Division that comes along uh, sexual uh, aspect does not come into scripture. There is no uh, there, there is no gender disparity. So this statement contradicts the scriptures and even contradicts some, the, some law of some countries where you must not bring in gender, gender disparity or gender uh, inequality. It, contra it, it, it contradicts the law of some country. In some country, it becomes even a big co legal contradiction. So God wants us to help both male and female. However, in James chapter 1, verse 7, it says that when we should, the, the pure religion, the pure practice of religion is this, to provide help, succor for the widows, for the orphans, but considering yourself to be unspotted from the world. So what the scripture is saying in James chapter 1 verse 7 is that as a matter of fact, we are to help the less privileged amongst us, whether they are male or female, we must not discriminate between male and female because they are all children of God. Being female does not bring them low. Being a male does not reduce them. They are, all, they are all children of God. But however, when a man is to help a woman, he is to use wisdom and be careful not to allow his good deeds to turn into evil. You know what I mean as adults. So that is just the only... Uh, the only question there, when a male is helping a female, you are to maintain holiness, as we see in James chapter 1, verse 7. So that statement that men should help only their fellow men and women should help themselves, that women have a way of leading men bringing about a scandal in the life of men who try to help them is not correct. It, it might have been said from personal experience, yes. But personal experience is not the best, it's not the best in Bible doctrine. As a matter of fact, pastors should not make their personal experience a doctrine because it will lead to confusion it will lead to false teaching. The scripture should be our basis when we are making a statement of fact. However, when we choose to, uh, as pastors, when we choose to speak our own opinion, it is very important we make it clear that this is our opinion and not the scriptures. Paul often did that. He said, I am the one saying this, not the Lord. If you read the letters of Paul, there are many places, especially in the aspect of advising, uh, his advice for marriage. There are many places he said, this is my own thinking, not the scripture. 
So it is very important that men of God stop creating unnecessary controversy by making categorical statements and suggesting that they are doctrinal. It's wrong. It's wrong. When you make certain statements that have no foundation in Scripture, which is purely, you know, said from your personal experience, you must not make it a doctrine. Otherwise, it will, it, it will be confusing. It will give a very wrong signal to the Christian community. So that statement does not have biblical foundation. Number four, you will never suffer or hunger if you give your life to Jesus Christ. That sounds, sounds fine, but it's a false it's a false teaching. If the moment you give your life to Jesus Christ, you have left the enemy camp, the enemy's camp to the camp of the Lord, you have provoked an annoyance. You have provoked a war. You might have to suffer for Christ. Those of you in the other religion, you know that your religion forbids you from making decision for Christ. When you make a decision to now follow Christ, you may have to suffer. But the good thing about this is that Jesus Christ promises to stand with you in every circumstances that you may go through as a believer. He says in his word that there is no temptation that is greater than us. But God permits such temptation and he knows that we are equal to the tax and is able to see us through to the end so that we are able to bear it. Jesus Christ passed through a lot of trouble. At a point in his life, he became very hungry and there was no food to eat. And Satan came in to tempt him to turn stones to bread. So, coming to Christ does not mean that you will not have economic challenges. You will, but God has promised that he will supply all our needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Jesus himself said that, be, uh, that in this world you will suffer trouble or tribulation, but be of good cheer, that is, be happy. I have overcome the world. The apostles wrote and, and says that anyone who will live righteously, Paul wrote, writing to Timothy, say we suffer persecution in this world. So anybody telling you that if you give your life to Jesus Christ, that you will not suffer trouble, you will not hunger, is a lie. All this will be allowed by God to strengthen and build your muscles, your faith. And you, my friend, who may have come from the other religion, they will hate you. Your parents will hate you. Your former religion members will want to eliminate you and kill you because they have not seen the light you have seen. They do not have the knowledge you have now. They will do a lot of things to eliminate you, but Jesus won't let them. You will suffer certain things, but in the end, it will build your faith. It will make you stronger and make you very resilient for Christ. So anybody preaching that you come to Jesus Christ, your troubles are over, you will not hunger, is a, it sounds like a good gospel, but it is false. Jesus Christ says that the moment you take, you accept him to his life, your life, you have, you have caused war. You have caused war. You have actually provoked a trouble. But be sure you will be a winner in the end. So we look at John chapter 16, verse 33 says you will suffer in this world for Christ, but you will be a victor. You will be a victor. You'll be more than conqueror. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, makes it clear that 
His grace is sufficient for you. His grace is sufficient for you. Number five, sow into my ministry and you will become a millionaire. Give so that God can mightily bless you. Is that, is that of the scriptures? We know that God blesses a cheerful giver. But it is wrong for the pastor to preach the gospel in a transactional manner. What do I mean? Bring and take. That transactional manner is against the spirit of the gospel. All of the gospel of Christ is of grace. It's not about what you can do, but what you should, what you want to do willingly for the kingdom of God is what really matters. It's not about what you are going to get, but what you are going to give. God gave so much to you. He gave us his son and did not withhold him. How will he not with his son also provide us all things that we need? These things have been spelled out in scripture. So we do not need any man of God to kind of scam us with such transactional preaching in order for us to donate everything we ever labored for in this life. That sounds like a scam. Chris, the, the, the different, now please, if you have not watched my video on one big difference between Christianity and other religion, if you have not watched that, that video, please go and watch it. One good thing about Christianity is that everything you have you ever received is by grace and not by your effort. God is primarily God is blessing you not because you have even given, even though He appreciates giving, charitable giving, a willing giving, yet. All that you ever become in God, in Christ, all that you ever receive is grace. And grace says it's a merited favor. You do not deserve it. Our pastors should preach more of grace than transactional gospel. The beauty of Christianity is that God does not put you into any duress to do anything. Read your scriptures back to back. In the Gospel of grace, there is nothing that is put on you to be to do on that duress, on that gunpoint. If you don't do this, you go to it's in, all, it's in other religion that if you don't pray, you go to hell. If you don't visit the the if, if you don't give, you go to hell. If you don't do this, you won't see paradise. If you don't do this, this will happen. If you don't do this, this will happen. The difference between that religion and Christianity is that in Christianity, God does not force you to do anything and has not never threatened that if you don't do this, you go to hellfire. He simply wants you to do what you want to do for him with love, willingly, and so that you may be blessed. So, Pastors should stop bringing in fear. 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 If you don't give your time, of course, the devourer will devour you. All these are not the New Testament preaching of grace. They are all stemming from the Old Testament law. God wants us to do everything we do with the motive of love. Why are you giving? To be blessed? No, I'm giving because I love Jesus. Why did you give to the church evangelism mission project? To be blessed? Not primarily, but primarily because I love Jesus and his work. I want his mission to spread across globe. My love for souls has moved me. We are constrained by the love of Jesus. So it is very important that pastors make 
their members to understand the teachings of grace. If Christians get to understand the rationale behind, the right rationale, the, the correct reason for doing what we are to do, they will do more. But instead, some pastors are using cohesion, which is imported from the law of Moses. That's why they are getting it wrong. We give because we love God. We give to assist his work and his servants and the people because we love the brethren. It is this rationale that moves God to bless you, not the amount of money you have given or so much of the activity, but it is the heart with which you have done these things. So pastors should learn to preach that way. And you will see the Christian community do even better in responding to free will giving. Now we're going to go to the next point, which says that should be point six. Paul's writing are not the words of God, of Christ. Now, this statement uh, is not actually correct because the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all scriptures is given by the inspiration of God. They are profitable for teaching, for correction in righteousness. All, underline the word all, including those written by Paul. Now, this, this statement is said, believing that Paul did not see Jesus. Paul didn't see Jesus physically, but he met Jesus in deeper revelation than even the other apostles. Did you not read where Paul was talking about the deep revelation that he had in writing to the Corinthian church? He said he was even taken to the third heaven and he had voices and languages and secret information that no human being on earth had been given privilege to hear. Another person that had such experience was John the Beloved, who is the writer of the book of Revelation. So if you, say, if you are talking about that for Paul didn't see Jesus, look, the, 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 the encounter of Paul with Jesus was even deeper than seeing him physically. So the words, the writing, the letters of Paul, and God used this man of God to write greater number of the passages of the Bible, especially in the New Testament, the letters. So his words were inspired. It's only just few of his statements, the verses that he says, this is my own, this is my own advice as somebody that I've seen and I tasted the Lord. This is my own suggestion from my experience of Jesus, from, from my study and my experience of life as someone that I have been serving the Lord all these years. So do even those ones that Paul said they were his opinion are still the word of God and they are, they, they are relevant even to today. So who tells you that, that the writings of Paul are not the words of Christ? They are canonized. They are part of the canonized scriptures. They are scriptures that the church has considered as inspired. And there's no man of God on earth that has the right to refute, to, to refute the writings of any of the apostles because they are the founding fathers of the Christian faith. All scriptures, including those of Paul, are inspired by the Holy Spirit, including those he said, these are my opinions. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 16, may, gave a warning. Please, every, script, every Christian must read that. Peter gave a warning in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 16. He says, Paul's, Paul, our brother, has written very deeply, and some of the things he wrote are difficult to understand by just a mere reader. But he said, unfortunately, he said, unfortunately, however, some 
who do not understand the deep mysteries of this our brother, this our great pastor, are twisting the writings of Paul and relegating it to their own destruction. Please read that scripture. That scripture clears this doubt that Paul's writing is of Christ and stand as binding on believers today. Peter even warned those who are relegating it to stop. He warned those who are twisting it to stop that the Apostle Paul happened to be giving greater grace to reveal deeper mysteries, deeper mysteries than even many of the apostles had done. Oh, glory, glory. I'm going to treat the last one. The last one says, Mary speaks for us. He pray, she prays for us. She prays for us. She prays to Jesus. Jesus prays to the Father. She is our mother. She is presented as immaculate, as not as a human being, but as a, as a deity that should be worshipped, the mother of God. This ideology is called Mary. Mary uh, Mariology. Can we find that in scriptures? It is very important that today's Christians go back to their Bible. We can no longer leave the scriptures to the, to the church elders anymore. We, the younger generation, must question many of their teachings. We must go back to probe their teaching using the foundation of scriptures. Many of the teachings that we have today in the Pentecostal churches, in the Orthodox churches, in Catholic church, were developed by the early founding fathers. I can categorically tell you that some of them do no, long, do no longer resonate with the truth of the scriptures. Because they were, they were formed as a result of the situation of that time. Not actually looking at the implication of the doctrinal basis. So, that is the reason why we can't say that because this person who said this is our leader, who will swallow that, what is wrong, hook, line, and sinker. Yes, I accept my leader as being my leader, as being somebody that God has given giving the grace to lead me. But if he errs by giving me this, a, a, a teaching that is out of scriptures, I am not to follow it because the scripture has, the scripture has commanded me that Jesus Christ is my ex perfect example and not the bishop, not the general overseer, not my pastor. So if my pastor has said something that is not scriptural, it behoves a me not to accept that teaching. Yes, I may accept every other teaching he has done correctly, but for that, if that particular one, I'm not going to accept it. I will prove it with the scripture. If it does not tally with the scripture, I'm not going to accept it. I'll, I'll, I'll throw it to the dustbin. That's me. And that is what... The, that is what the modern Christian today should do. Jesus is our perfect example. And that's the person we are looking onto. We are not looking onto Jews. Yes, we are to learn good qualities from them. I'm not doubting that. We are to learn. Paul says, copy me as I copy Christ. That's fine. But when a leader has misfired, I'm not to misfire with him or with her. And to stand on the truth. Mariology has no basis in scripture. Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, is just like any other vessel that God has used. It's not higher than the Apostle Paul, Peter, James, and John. It's not higher than, the, than, than, than all other as servants of God. They are in the same rank. They are in the rank of the righteous. They are not to be worshipped. 
Worshipping them is evil. It's idolatry to the core. And if you want to run with your church doctrine, you don't care about your soul, you might miss it. Your soul is more important than the pride of your denomination, than the pride of the, the Christian denomination you belong. The truth of the scripture is more important, and that's why we must discard Mariology. It has no basis in scripture. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says it all that they will have one Lord and one mediator before God and man, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. No other mediator. Jesus Christ, the, the Bible also makes it clear in the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 34, that Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God praying for us, not Mary. Please, check out the scriptures. All the scriptures to this lesson have been pasted in the description below. Uh, please try and like this video if it has blessed you. Uh, click the subscription button so that you can encourage this channel to grow. Thank you. When uh, we'll come your way again with something very, very, very solid, controversial, and scriptural again. We'll see. So thank you. If you have any question or comment or objection, please use the comment section below. Thank you.